you. Okay, so uh, Faraday instituted the, uh, initiated the uh, scientific study of Faraday waves, um, which occur when a, a fluid layer is vibrated uh, vertically, and that's in 1831. And he observed the classic crystalline patterns which tile the plane, that is to say stripes, squares, and hexagons. Uh, here's what a square Faraday waves look like. You see that the uh, peaks become troughs and the troughs become peaks. Um, now uh, I'm doing a history of Faraday waves, their scientific study. That was experiments. Uh, for the moment, they'll be passed to theory and numerics. And the first linear stability analysis was done by Benjamin and Ursel in 1954. Um, this, uh, the K, this axis, this is the wave number of the pattern, spatial wave number, and AC over G is the um, amplitude of the shaking, which only occurs above a uh, critical one. Now, 19, uh, from 1831 to 1954 may strike you as a long time. That's 123 years. And in fact, um, that has been um, reproduced throughout the history of the Faraday instability. If you look at the standard pattern forming systems, um, let's see, does, does this, uh, let's see, uh, did, did, which one is the pointer? No pointer? The front one. Front one, okay. Oops, yeah. Okay, there. If you look at the standard classic pattern forming systems, Rayleigh Bernard convection, Taylor Coet flow, uh, they were first seen experimentally by scientists anyway in the 1890s by uh, Coet and Maloc, and the first experiments by Bernard, and then the first linear stability analyses followed not so long, af well, not so long by these scales, afterwards, 1923 by Taylor and Rayleigh in. Um, around uh, also around 1916 or so, um, both for with viscosity and without. Okay, so that's these, so you see, that whereas the Faraday instability, which was this Faraday waves, which were discovered so much, again, scientifically published so much earlier, uh, in 1831, the first linear stability analysis was done in 1954, so a much bigger gap. So you see this has, in fact, plagued the Faraday instability for the whole time, because then you see these uh, linear stability analyses, um, yeah, that is done done only in 1954, and then uh, then there's a whole bunch of work starting in the 90s. Okay, so why is that? Why was there this work starting in the 90s? Um, well, I put it down to the influence of Stefan Fove, who uh, is pictured here. I think this is a recent picture, but he hasn't aged very much. And at the time of the, uh, the, the work I'm going to describe, he was in Lyon in France, which is here. And what happened in 91, 94? Well, he was joined by these two fellows, um, Jay, who we've seen depicted many times. And as we see, he's, he's like Stephen Fou, I guess. He doesn't seem to age much. I think this is a recent picture, but it looks very much like the Jay that I knew before. And um, this picture isn't so great, but this is a recent picture of Stuart Edwards, for those who know him. I asked him to send me a picture, yes, and he did. Um, yeah, I could, yeah, it could be a little better, uh, but you see, I mean, I guess mostly he's bald is the point. Anyway, there he is. That's Stuart <laughs> Edwards. Um, <coughs> um, and so he came from Texas, from Austin, where we all were for postdoc. And Jay came to visit us. I, I did this picture this way to make this nice world thing, but I think that at the time he was probably visiting from Texas on the way to, uh, to visit back in Hebrew. Okay. Anyway, so everybody converged there in Lyon. And um, there was this remarkable picture that many of you have already seen, perhaps. These are quasi patterns produced by Edwards and Fauve at that time, the first fluid dynamical quasi patterns. And People, some people uh, accused um, uh, them of uh, that it, um, it being uh, depending on the on the container shape, and so of course Edwards, who are those who know him, very original fellow, he asked the machine shop to uh, make a container the shape of France, and so the machinist said, "Oh, you mean hexagon shaped?" Because in France, <laughs> France is called l'hexagone, le, le right? As a popular word, those who are France know that. He said, no, no, the shape of 
France <laughs> with Brittany and the whole thing. And there he produced the quasi patterns. This picture has been reproduced uh, many, many times. And this was followed later by a lot of other quasi patterns, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, super lattices by the group Kudroli um, Pierre Golub in 1998. So let me continue then with my little history of Faraday instability. This is then the diagram that Benjamin and Ursel produced uh, for the inviscid case. Um, and again, because uh, Faraday waves were so little studied, it, um, it was my good fortune to do the first linear instability, anal instability analysis with viscosity. And uh, you know, it wasn't such a big deal. It's just that somehow it's been neglected over the years. And what you find is uh, not too surprising, that is to say viscosity damps the instability. You need to uh, shake it higher or shake it with m more, um, more vigor to uh, make the tongues happen. And they separate. These are uh, harmonic, subharmonic, uh, sub harmonic, etc. tongues. And that was 40 years after Benjamin and Ursel. Let me tell you a little bit about this linear stability analysis. First, I tell you about Benjamin and Ursel, their inviscid analysis. It involves, um, it involves uh, uh, expanding the surface height into various eigenfunctions of the surface form, which can be plane waves. And then you get a Fourier floquet form. And Benjamin Ursel showed that the, for each Fourier mode, K, um, the surface height coefficient, uh, Fourier coefficient, obeyed a Matthew equation. And the linear stability analysis, the, uh, the stability problem reduces to a balance. Is, this is, in effect, this is, um, uh, I guess it has a lot to do with, somebody will tell me who knows more than this. Isn't this the pressure equation? You know, the, ba the balloon is balanced by the surface tension. Uh, this, essentially, that's what this is when you say, right? Uh, it, this, but a little more complicated form. Anyway, so you write that, the balance between surface tension and, um, and the, the jump in pressure. And if you write the uh, temporal coefficients of this floquet form as a vector, you find this matrix equation in which the forcing amplitude A plays the role of an eigenvalue. And that's unusual because uh, normally the eigenvalue and eigenvalue problem is the growth rate. But this is not what I did. Um, so that's, that's unusual. Uh, usually you fix a forcing parameter like the Rayleigh number, like the Reynolds number, and you get out a growth rate. And in this procedure, the growth rate uh, is fixed and you get the amplitude. Um, so that means you can trace the tongues directly. And this procedure also has the merit of being able to be uh, generalized to the full viscous problem and any other periodic uh, forcing functions. So this was the result. You've already seen it. These are the tongues as a function of spatial wave number. You have the, um, the uh, forcing amplitude A at which you first see, uh, um, at w which you first see uh, Faraday waves with this wave number appearing. And that was published in 94. And one of the first significant results of this was Kumar, who in 96 found that for some parameters, you could actually have harmonic response at a, um, at a, a lower threshold than subharmonic. And now I can't resist giving my little um, demo. Some have already seen it. Um, what is subharmonic harmonic means? You have the, the sh table being shaken like this, and subharmonic is like this, and harmonic is like this. Okay, so both seem natural. Uh, anyway, that's uh, so uh, that was it. Would had been thought before Kumar's work that uh, they were all um, that the first response was always subharmonic. Right. Yes. Oh, um, uh, um, that, let's see, I have a whole bunch. They can't, they can't. These are two eigenvalues that are there. Okay, I, I, these are a bunch of slides I cut out. They're traversing the circle, and then, and then, and then they do this, and, and they do this, and, and there's really just two of them, and they, uh, they can't do that. These are not different eigenvalues. These are essentially the same one. Okay, so that, that explains it, right? Well, um, <laughs> I'm sorry, what did you say? What was graphically. Your? Graphically, yes. Okay, that's right. O only graphically. It really is essentially the same one. Oh, I can, all right, all right. I'll go through my, I cut these things out. I like them so much. Um, no, no, I don't know what it's, it's really. 
here. Okay, so this you go through. This is this red dot here. Um, uh, this is it. it this, it could be, it's inviscid, but it could, might as well be viscous. Let's move across in K, so you have these two eigenvalues. And in this case, it really is just two, as in the Matthew equation. And, um, and as you m go across in K, on the bottom you see the Floquet multipliers. And here they are on the boundary, uh, merging at um, minus one. And here they are then separating again in the stable region where they're not going to become bigger than one in magnitude. They're cross going around the unit circle. Now they're going to exit at one, the harmonic boundary, and then they're going to go, uh, th th now you see you're unstable inside the harmonic tongue, and then you come back and you ex and now you go back. So that, right, that explains it? Yeah, okay. What a nice question. I got to show what I had, <laughs> what I had cut out. Uh, Okay, so uh, I've talked about this. Now, um, sequentially comes my, the, uh, I mean, of course, this conference is about Jay. This is the one paper uh, that I published with Jay uh, there. It was in 97. Uh, I came to Israel, I, I think. We discussed it and we worked together. I came to his lab and so on, and that was very nice. Uh, to this day, I must say, I don't quite, un I was trying to read it over. I don't quite understand it. Believe it or not, I've published another paper on scaling and I, didn't really, well, maybe we'll, you'll explain it to me sometime. Okay. Um, okay, so now let me, um, let me get to more of Jay's work, which was on two-frequency forcing, and let me give you the idea behind that. I th suppose that Fouve and Edwards knew this when they were doing this, but of course it took me some uh, time to catch up. Let's start with something very simple that many people know, the rayleigh lamb inviscid dispersion relation. This is a gravity and capillary waves, right? Everybody knows this thing. So. Uh, the uh, what Rayleigh and Lamb did this for was, uh, I believe, you'll, again, those of you who know more history or science will tell me if I'm wrong, if you put a perturbation with a certain wave number, K, on a surface, in what, what, with what frequency will it oscillate, say, as it dies, if it's damped or whatever, okay? So that's one interpretation. You uh, put on a sp spatial wave number K and it oscillates at that frequency. But you can also, I mean, equations, like non-dimensional numbers, can be interpreted the opposite way, too. Who says one is the cause of the other? If you have a frequency, omega, that elicits a wave number, K. And I can't tell you how long it took me to, to come to this obvious you know, but anyway, now I do, so now I'm telling all of you. Uh, did you ever notice when, you, when you, people write papers, you can see if they're writing their, their first paper on a certain subject, they go into great detail on all kinds of stuff, because they understand it. Now they have to tell the world. <laughs> and then their later papers, well, yeah, that's old stuff. Okay, so, so I'm like that. I'm a recent uh, convert, fairly recent, so I tell you. So the other interpretation, of course, is you impose a, a, a frequency and you get out of wave wave number, and that is what Faraday instability is. You're, you're imposing this shaking, and that elicits a wave number. And this makes the Faraday system um, differ, of course, from Taylor Couet and Rayleigh Bernard, where you, if you wish, the, wave no the wavelength is, is determined by the gap, and if you want to elicit different wave numbers, then you have to do things like ramps, as people did in the 1980s, so as to have a small wave, uh, wave height here and a large height here. Uh, but we don't. We can just have different omegas. Different omegas, what does that mean? If you have an um, oscillation with several different frequencies, would that elicit a perturbation with several spatial wave numbers? And I don't know who thought of that. Was it Edwards or was it Fove? I think it must have been Fove. He had experience with it. But it was, uh, they, they thought of it and they did it. So, okay, here's a paper then, later paper of mine, um, with the same Edwards. Again, we're going down this memory lane for those of us who knew New Edwards. Um, here are the tongues with only, okay, with the, he originated also, or they, this pair originated the notation like this, where you combine two different frequencies with different coefficients, and we call them trigonometric. We have divided, instead of having A and B as coefficients, we have, uh, we have the ampli overall amplitude, and then we have, uh, we represent the ratio of one frequency versus the other temporal frequency with uh, an angle, psi, mixing angle. Um, right. So as you start off with all uh, m here, km, that's the red one, you have this wave number. And you, when you end up with this um, all uh, l, you have this wave number. Oh, I've used different notation here. Uh, you have this one here, which is slightly different. And in between, it follows 
as you're going in, in um, as you're mixing the two, uh, making different amplitudes, the two frequencies, you see that it's it's very weird. It's not you might expect. Uh, this is what I had expected that you have a system of tongues like this, and then you had another one that's kind of uh, up there in the cloud, and it comes down, and the other one comes up like that. But no, it uh, maybe because of what you said there, it all mixes up very exotically. You have islands, you have weird stuff. This is how this is this is the linear stability diagram for a mixed. Um, frequency uh, signal. Uh, now, of course, that doesn't explain any kind of patterns you would see because all that shows is that you have two different wave numbers. And so you could fill up the ring just as, uh, you know, with any kind of orientations and any kind of amplitudes. But in fact, so let me just explain what that, I mean, here you have a picture of a quasi pattern. And this is one of these pictures from Edwards and Fove. And this is the angle that mixes between this frequency, temporal frequency, and that one. And you have these two different wave lengths here in purple and blue, like here. So you see them in the quasi pattern. A quasi pattern is, uh, has as its spectrum them. Again, uh, this is not at all straightforward. The, the fact that you have these two lengths, that's fine. But you could build a lot of things with two different lengths, two, two different orientations. And this was the focus of work for the next 10 years. So let me turn to some of that work. Uh, two frequency forcing. This is Epstein and Feinberg. I always thought it was kind of cruel that um, the uh, honoree in a birthday conference, he has to sit and listen to everybody else's work. So I thought I would try and give him maximum exposure here. This is his work. And so you see different pictures observed in the lab here. And these are their Fourier spectra. And you see they have two different uh, wavelengths. And now you'll tell me I'm interpreting it incorrectly. But you see the discretization, uh, which is not, of course, predicted by linear theory. The only thing that's predicted by linear theory is having two rings. But this discrete spectrum is not. Here's another picture. This is Arbel and Feinberg. This is their big survey article on um, two frequency forcing. And this is from mn equals 2 and 3. And you see some of these pictures, I think, are in uh, or some things, pictures resembling them are in the poster. Look at all the different things they produce, super, square, hexagon, K, all these kind of things, blah, 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 blah. The, the paper's full of them. And this occupied theorists for, you know, kind of ever since. Uh, Edwards and, Fulv and Feinberg also produced a lot of their own theory, as it happens, but then there were all these pure theorists that, that churned out paper after paper after paper to explain uh, quasi-patterns. And um, so that, that turned into a whole field based on this, uh, <coughs> this one thing that happened there in Lyon with Fauve, and it branched out. OK, so that is the, uh, oh no, not, not quite, excuse me, I, I am not quite finished. Because uh, I had the good fortune to get some, you remember you gave me some movies just to inspire me, so I get to show them now. This is a movie from the Feinberg Lab. Come on, let's go. Um, yes, there you go. It's not, I think it's a strobed movie. You don't see the basic. Um, the basic uh, Faraday thing, but you see underneath it, uh, this is a quasi pattern. Yeah, I think so. Okay, this movie I have to say is perhaps a little bit subtle, um, <laughs> but fortunately I have another one. This one is less so here. Um, this is super squares, so you see, of course, the squares. But now you're going to see squares of squares. And you're going to see, you see, this is a big square surrounding the little squares, right? This is super squares. Do I have that right? And this is elicited by two frequency forcing. Uh, and that's why you have the two wavelengths. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, when you start with these instabilities, all these theories, the linear theory of uh, Faraday. Yes, the yes. Uh, so the nonlinearity probably saturates the, the effect. Yes, of course it does. But it also chooses but, but the it orientation. Also, it also changes shifts the frequency and the wave vector? Oh, no, that, all that, I mean, how should I say, uh, these guys, they've, um, they, they've had their hands full. Uh, yes, they, they, right, when you say you're, you're on one of these papers, I don't know how much of it you've read, but you, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, you know, group theory, uh, people, if the names Gajubitsky mean anything to you, um, Th these guys are, are, yes, that's right, they, they, I won't say they predict everything, especially since they, they start, look, they were with Jay, they started with the experiment and then explained it. You know, the proof of a theory is you start with a theory and predict the experiment, and I'm not sure that they have done that yet. Would
residence. I'm not sure if that's what he was talking about. Perhaps he was talking about along the circle, perhaps. I'm not sure. The discretization of the, of the spatial spectrum. Uh, no, all that, I mean, they address, they address these kinds of questions. Why uh, the, the, the choosing of the, uh, 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 all that linear theory tells you is this circle. The idea that you have this choice of points is a whole nother matter, and that's the kind of thing that they address. Okay, so as I wrote in this slide a little prematurely, everything else I'm going to say is about single frequency forcing, and um, because that's all I've done. Okay, so back to this history of, uh, that after the two frequency adventure, uh, let's go back to regular old Faraday, single frequency. So, um, the f uh, as I said, Faraday has always lagged behind. The first two-dimensional numerical simulation was done only in 2000. That's really kind of late when you think 1970s for uh, for Taylor Coed and for Rayleigh Bernard. And the first three frequency, a uh, three frequency, did I say two frequency? Two dimensional. The first three dimensional numerical simulation, again, because it's lagged behind so much, I got to be, to do that uh, with my colleagues, uh, uh, Perrinet and Zurich. And they, uh, that's this paper here, and this is the numerical methods, and, um, and he matched it with experiment and uh, with the flow K functions. One doesn't often look at flow K functions. This is the omega over two tongue, the omega, the three omega over two tongue. This is the, the response at these, in these different tongues. And this is the kind of agreement he got. The red and the black are experiment um, by Kitik et al. And, uh, which, uh, and the line is, um, is, his, um, is the numerical simulation. Uh, okay, so, no, actually, no, 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 I'm wrong about that. Forget what I just said. Okay, and here are the two patterns he observed. You already saw the squares, I think, and then here, are the, here is our hex, here's a hexagonal lattice. Now, this is a little bit misleading because to make everything prettier, this is really only a computation in a single domain. It's just repeated periodically for the visualization. Uh, this is only a computation in a single square. It's just repeated for the visualization. So what I'm going to tell you now is about a single hexa hexagon and this was something that uh, Nicolas Perrinet discovered here. Uh, oh, yeah, here. Um, so this is a single hexagonal cell, even uh, which looks like this, uh, the, the minimal cell for, uh, for observing hexagonal pattern. And here's the resolution. Uh, and um, with, with the uh, numerical code, you can, uh, the kind that my colleagues produced, uh, you, can actually, you can also observe the velocity field. Uh, in addition to the surface. So here you see at the lowest point, you see, of course, the velocity is most quiescent when the, excuse me, the surface is most quiescent when the velocity is highest. You know, they're out of phase with one another, right? V is dt of uh, z, right? So this, even though it's, you know, real quiet, enough, this is when it's on its way up and um, so on. Okay, so, um, here is what he observed. There's a long time evolution. This is time, and this is the Faraday oscillation here. And we're now, in our heads, strobing it. We're just taking the envelope. And here are four points taken on these, um, at this place here. Four points, four phases of the oscillation. And this is what they look like. This is just, this is these four points of this oscillation, the Faraday oscillation, like this. Okay, so that's very pretty, especially if you use a lot of color. And this is uh, now a ISO, uh, the contour uh, representation of the same thing. And that's just this. Okay, but you see that as, the, as far as the envelope goes, this is very plain. It's just a, a flat line like that, right? It's just constant amplitude, and it's just doing this hexagonal thing. Um, but then, as you see, things happen with that envelope. And what happens is it transforms to this pattern. These are, again, four temporal periods of one thing. And you see this has quite different symmetry. This is not hexagons at all. Five minutes, thank you. And then um, you see it doesn't content itself to do that. It goes back to something like this, uh, something kind of hexagonal, but not exactly. And then it goes back to the stripes and then back to the hexagons. Um, and again, this is not two frequency forcing. This is not, um, this is a single wavelength like this. It's been doubled just so you can see it better. Uh, or quadrupled, if you like. And it's just doing this, and it will do this at infinitum. Here are strobed movies. Oh, whoops. Um, these are strobed movies. Oh, well, I can't seem to show more than one of them. Um, but I don't think it... All right. Strobed movies will, will, will show you how these things, how the long-term uh, behavior of this. And so, 
um, we were very pleased with this. And uh, it's, if you look at it in phase space, it's, uh, it just goes around like this doing, doing, this was the original hexagons, these are the beaded stripes, and it goes around like this. So we were very happy with this. And now uh, we then wrote, or rather my colleagues wrote, a code that does large scale, that does, is super parallel, super everything, and it does, um, that was a single hexagonal cell, a single hexagonal cell doing all that, uh, um, right? But we want, uh, w especially my colleagues, you know, bigger is better, um, right? This, I, I've heard you, uh, you uh, you're of that school too, experimentally. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Not once, okay. <laughs> All right, forget about bigger is better. Bigger is nice. And so my colleagues also believed bigger was nice, and they built a big code, uh, which we paralyzed over a zillion, million things. And the first thing we did with it was produce super square patterns. And this is with my colleague. These are the ones who wrote the code. This is the uh, uh, principal investigator of that, a uh, postdoc at the time. This is the same Pirinei, and I remember I'm bringing him up here because he's in Chile, and he's looking for a job. He's brilliant. Uh, he's a really, really brilliant guy. If any of you have jobs, uh, contacts in, in Chile, um, he's finished two postdocs and he can, he can do anything. Okay, so w the thing that we found with the uh, big code was these super squares. They're like uh, J's, except these are produced with single frequency forcing. So you see the small squares, but you see that the, that the, the um, square spontaneously divides into a two by two square, which is out of phase with one another. You see that where the peaks are here are the troughs. Peaks, troughs, troughs, peaks. So they go like this. Yes? Ah, well, that's interesting. We tried all three kinds, Dirichlet, Neumann, and periodic. And you see these patterns best with Neumann. You see them every place. But you would think periodic, you would see them best. But no, it's Neumann. And this is a cut through this. And you, here you see clearly how the, this, this part is out of phase with this part. This one is in phase with that. OK, and again, just one, single frequency produces this. And we were happy to see in the literature an uh, article by Duedi and Fauve that had a, this is a, pic a schematic picture they made of an experimental diagram they made. So uh, they too had seen it, and so we were happy. We didn't set out to simulate it, but this is what happened. And then, oh, then we did um, uh, for Faraday instability on a sphere, and this is done by Aligo uh, Ebo Adu, who has returned to Djibouti. So I'm going to eventually go visit him in Djibouti. Anybody ever been to Djibouti? No, it's a French-speaking place. Uh, I didn't know any of this, but I know it now. Anyway, he did the same kind of analysis that I did for the uh, Flokeka case, but in spheres. Just, you know, instead of, you get spherical harmonics, you get, you know, just stuff like that. Here, okay. And now, um, so you shake, you have different frequencies, and now in plain case, you elicit different Ks. A K, of course, but a K isn't very interesting. A K is just the size, you know, it's just a wave, wavelength, a wave number. But in a, an L, a spherical L is very interesting. They're qualitatively different, qualitatively different. Um, so you get different, these different shapes from these different frequencies. And I'm going to show you a movie. This is a movie which, which of a frequency, a low frequency, it elicits 2, L equal 2. So what is L equal to? It's alternation between oblate, 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 and prolate. Uh, and so what's prolate? Prolate's like a football. Oblate is like a disc, right? So it's alternating between that. And remember these codes that my colleagues write. I can't take no credit for it. Also have the whole velocity field. Don't pay any attention to this. This is how the bound, this is how the solid exterior is shown. But this is the true velocity field, and you see it oscillating between prolate and oblate here. And you're going to see something else. Of course, it, it's, 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 this is, um, you know, it's been turned on. It's going in time, yes? So if you wanted to do this, mm -mm. what would you be doing? Inflating and deflating a balloon? No, you wouldn't. No, that it has to do it itself. You would be suspending something without gravity, and you experimentalists can try and figure out how to do this, and doing some kind of magnetic acoustic something, no, uh, frequency. Means, uh, the whole thing going in and out from oh, everywhere. Oscillating gravity from the center. There. That's right. <laughs> do it. Do it. Okay, now I want you to see something. I want you to see something. This is off axis. Notice, it used to be on axis, now it's off axis. It's not just doing its oblate prolate thing. It's also, it's also not oriented that way anymore. And this, we don't know. We don't know if that's a discovery or if that's an artifact of putting it on a 3D grid or what. We're asking the mathematicians to explain this. Is there an instability of this that, that makes it, you know, is it like a drift instability? Um, so that we like this. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, ver okay. 
When we went up to the, <laughs> no, I, I really, I'm, I, it's, it is almost finished. I, I understand. I hate people who fight with chairman. It's so immature. Um, <laughs> and, um, so it turns out, I didn't used to know this, but the platonic solids, here are the platonic solids. There are five of them, and four of them are duals with one another. This is the cube and the octahedron, dodecahedron, icosahedron. And an oscillating drop is exactly the right thing to observe it because what, what is the dual? It's when the corner or the maximum becomes a face or a minimum. So what you have, and the tetrahedron is its own dual. So indeed, we were able to observe all of these things. This is the tetrahedron. It's oscillating and it becomes its own dual tetrahedron, right? An upside down tetrahedron. This is a cube which alternates between being uh, an octahedron and a cube. This is with a higher, and you elicit these by higher frequency. This is the amazing <coughs> thing about Faraday. You just change the frequency and you get a different wave, wave number, or in this case, a different shape because L's are different shapes. And then we did five, which uh, goes, uh, has, uh, it's predicted to have an axisymmetric pattern, and then it becomes a D4 pattern predicted by the theorists. And this is the alternation between an icosahedron and a dodecahedron. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen an icosahedron, dodecahedron, everybody has heard of anyway. Um, so we get these nice shapes merely by changing, and this, we didn't know any of this theory before, we just, we just put on the frequency. And then this amaz another amazing thing, this is L equal 1, which you cannot get for capillary waves, you can only get it for gravity waves. Remember, it's forced only radially. And what is, it, what is L equal 1? It's this, boing, 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 boing. When we first saw it, we were amazed. So these are my colleagues who've written the code. You know, it's big deal code. And I think it was, um, where is Michael Deegan? Deegan, Deegan, Deegan. He's here. OK, so he was saying, oh, but I'm interested in splashes. So you see my colleague's code does splashes. It does all this kind of stuff. I have to give them all this credit. They, they did a great job, my colleagues. Um, and um, so we're making up for lost time in Faraday Waves. Thank you. Questions when mm. we <coughs> change to talk? Mm. Mm. Mm hmm.